4.30 a.m. we can start. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Ali Kujuri. I am uh, uh, one of the organizers of this uh, lecture series. And uh, of course, we have others who have been helping us. Uh, there is uh, Mr. Sharam Marijuani, and then also Ronnie Goodland, uh, you know, who uh, are also among the main organizers. Uh, on, on behalf of the uh, School of Science and Technology, let me welcome you all, and also our department, of course. Welcome you all to this fifth lecture uh, uh, for this academic year, and uh, believe it or not, 128 lectures since the time we started in 2006. Uh, before I start uh, introduce, introducing our uh, guest speaker for today, let me mention that uh, uh, first of all, Rani, the good news is uh, Rani has ordered pizza, which is going to arrive at what, uh, 5.30. <laughs> and then uh, uh, the next uh, talk is uh, 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 titled <coughs> Building a Software Defined Radio Application in Seven Minutes. I bet you, you, you all would be interested in this. And then that's going to be by Mr. Uh, Mohammed uh, Salah, uh, and uh, he's a, an R&D engineer in uh, National Instruments. Uh, also, that at uh, 5:30, I apologize. I need to go uh, to a class, and then uh, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, Dr. Uh, Faraman would be here to, I mean, after me to just to answer any questions and so on. And then if not, then Mr. Sharam Marivani uh, will, uh, I mean, is here. Okay, about our uh, guest speaker for today, Dr. Erkin uh, Secker uh, is, is here now, uh, and he comes from uh, UC Davis. Uh, the uh, title of his talk is Gold Phones as Advanced Biomedical Device Coatings. Dr. Erkin uh, Secker received his PhD degree in electrical engineering from University of Virginia in 2007. Following postdoctoral positions in chemistry in uh, University of Virginia uh, and uh, bioengineering at Center of Engineering in Medicine at Harvard Medical School. He joined the Department of uh, EE and Computer Engineering at UC Davis in 2011. As an adjunct, I'm sorry, as, as an associate professor, he is uh, leading the interdisciplinary multifunctional nanoporous metals research group with a, with, uh, with a overarching goal of understanding and controlling nanostructured material properties and their interaction with biological systems to develop novel uh, 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 biomedical tools. He is uh, the recipient of Fund uh, for Medical Discovery Award uh, from Massachusetts General Hospital at UC uh, Lab Fees uh, Research Grant and an NSF Career Award. He served as an associate sci scientific advisor for Science Tran Translational Medicine Journal, was invited to participate in National Academy of Engineering's <coughs> annual Frontiers of Engineering Education Symposium and was selected as a BMES Cellular and Molecular Engine Bioengineering Young Innovator of 2016. So here is Dr. Thank you, um, thank you Ali, for the uh, introduction, and thanks to all the organizers for reminding me, and uh, thanks for sticking around at the end of today. We are looking forward to the pizza all together, so it's really good. Uh, so today I'll... Um, I'll tell a little bit about uh, my, um, so let's see how these work. All right, um, so I come basically from, a, oh, so hopefully some of these will not be lost there, but we'll see. So um, my uh, PhD is in electrical engineering and I did a postdoc in biochemistry. So my main expertise is microfabrication. So basically building micro, uh, computer chips. That's how I started. Uh, and now I teach basically courses on that. But it's a very versatile uh, field, the microfabrication. You can apply it to a lot of different things. For example, building uh, biomedical devices or implantable uh, things for uh, studying health. So um, I, in my PhD, I worked on uh, porous metals, mostly mechanics of them. 
And then I did some work on uh, uh, microfluidics, which is again uh, a field using the uh, microflu uh, microfabrication technology to make small channels where you can guide the flow through them. And this is for basically uh, making small chemical reservoirs, if you will. Um, and we've also built uh, microfluidic circuits that are kind of analogous to the electrical circuits. Uh, but with these ones, for example, a fluidic analogy to a capacitor is a deformable membrane. So you apply pressure, water basically deflects the membrane, and basically it acts as a capacitor. Resistors are uh, basically the channel dimensions that uh, uh, restrict the flow. So if you put together uh, a capacitor and a resistor, you basically have RC filters that become frequency sensitive. So you can basically now have branches with different capacitances and resistors, hence uh, impedances. And by basically changing the pumping frequency of the liquid, you can uh, uh, basically guide the flow into different channels without using any valves. So that was some of the things that we've done in the uh, uh, back a few years, I mean, about a decade ago now. Today, what I'll talk about is uh, the material that we uh, focus on in my group. This is uh, nanopores gold. So basically, these are scanning electron microscope images. And you can uh, think of this material as basically just a foam sponge, but the pores are tens of nanometers. So tens of nanometers is about uh, a thousandth of the thickness of hair. So these are very small pores. And this is a cross-section of that. The way we make this is you start with a gold-silver alloy. So it's basically the white gold uh, that you may have heard of. You dip it in nitric acid. Silver atoms are leached. And when the silver is moving away from the surface, gold atoms self-assemble into this porous sponge. So if you heat this up, you basically enhance the atoms' diffusion on the surface. And you can basically coarsen these uh, structures, but keep kind of a similar morphology. So this is important for uh, material science because you can change the structure of the film and study, for example, how it uh, affects the capacitance uh, if it was used as an electrode, or uh, uh, how it, uh, whether it stores more energy in a fuel cell. What we are interested in is more the biomedical applications of this. But a couple of uh, key things with this material is it's microfabrication compatible. So this is very important. There are a lot of different nanomaterials, like carbon nanotubes. But the ability to integrate it into the process flow for microchips makes it a very important uh, attribute, because then you can take it to the industry and they can uh, adopt that material. And other aspects are electrical conductivity. And you can attach molecules to these surfaces uh, to change the biological and chemical properties. Um, so um, it seems like there's kind of a lag. Um, so a little bit of background about this material. Uh, this actually dates back to pre-Columbian times. Uh, the artifacts that are found from those days uh, turns out were built from a material uh, that is uh, basically uh, copper and gold composite. And it's basically what's called tumbaga. And copper and gold is mechanically very sturdy, but it does not have that gold shiny finish. So goldsmiths back in the day leached the copper out of the surface and compacted it to make gold. So the, uh, on the top surface, so it has the shiny finish. So, but if, as you can imagine, the access to scanning electron microscopes during pre-Columbian times was not very easy. So you basically, if they had looked at it at that time, they would have actually seen the same uh, porous morphologies that we see there. But now people have looked at the computational aspects of it. How do you uh, develop models uh, about how this porosity uh, develops? Uh, we've studied mechanical properties. Some people uh, are looking into it. Uh, a lot of people are looking at its catalytic properties. You can actually use it for, uh, for example, oxidizing methanol or those type of catalytic applications. Some people are also looking at optical applications. What my group uh, pioneered is more the bio, uh, biomedical applications of this material. So we have three main research thrusts. Uh, one is still the material science of this material. Uh, the second one is building detectors to detect basically nucleic acids, which are markers found in all living organisms for detecting pathogens or early diagnosis of cancer uh, from markers in blood. And the other one is neural interfaces, basically uh, the, these interfaces that can be implanted into the brain or basically interface with the neurons to rehabilitate patients or treat some neurological disorders. So there will be... Uh, I'll, I'll keep everything fairly conceptual, but if, you, if there are parts that you are very unclear about, definitely interrupt me and ask questions so we can have it kind of uh, interactive. So the first thing that I'm going to talk about uh, is um, when it comes up. Well, uh, let's see. Uh, the neural interfaces. So 
are any of you familiar with neural interfaces? Have you heard about brain machine interfaces before? So the way it works is, so let's imagine that a patient basically had a spinal cord injury. Uh, then basically the signals that come from the brain do not go uh, to the muscles to basically move the arms or the legs. So the idea is, can, uh, can you now implant electrodes into the brain to collect that information from the part of the brain that sends those signals? and then decode them and send it to either prosthetic arms or uh, loop it back into the muscles. So you can actually bypass that broken uh, connection in the spine. So for, to do these, you typically use these electrodes that get implanted. So you want to monitor the electrical signature, uh, deliver electrical currents or uh, drugs to basically modulate the neural uh, signature. And while you are doing this, you want to make sure that the uh, tissue basically does not reject these devices. So one example of this is, for example, epilepsy. Uh, one uh, majority of the treatments for epilepsy is uh, through drugs, but eventually uh, you may need to do a surgery because if it's uh, intractable, and for that one basically they carve out the region of the brain that has the epileptic uh, focus. And this obviously uh, is debilitating because it uh, removes the functions there as well. So one way of doing it is can uh, implanting electrodes in there to uh, basically record the electrical activity and if there's an oncoming uh, epileptic seizure you release drug molecules to kind of suppress it and it does not turn into uh, a full-blown seizure just a little bit of uh, basics of the neural interfaces so typically you have these silicon shanks that are built with uh, microfabricated uh, uh, microfabrication technology you have these electrodes uh, these are typically about like 20 to 30 microns uh, in uh, diameter or uh, the critical size then you implant this what happens is tissue basically uh, when it goes into the brain tissue tissue reacts to it so this is kind of similar to if you were to get a splinter in your finger the body basically has these cells called fibroblasts that create a, uh, encapsulates that splinter to protect the body from it so something similar happens when an electrode is implanted into the brain and these cells called uh, astrocytes began to basically encapsulate the electrode. So what happens, uh, did you have a question? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. So uh, if the uh, astrocytes encapsulate the, um, uh, the electrode, then you create a sheet that is electrically insulating, so you can no longer pick up the electrical signals. So what we are trying to do is, you typically have an electrode, and you have a neural cell that sits on it, and neurons basically pump these ions. These are the, the, the origin of the electrical signals you have in the brain. So if you are, it's kind of a uh, emitter uh, receiver problem or transmitter receiver problem. If you have it closer to the, if you have two of them closer together, then you have higher signal to noise ratio. But if you, due to this uh, scarring, like the astrocytes uh, reacting to the surface, if they begin to go in between the neurons and the electrode, then you begin to lose signal to noise ratio. So in essence, uh, we basically want the neurons to attach to the surface, but these astrocytes, the scar forming cells to be kind of pushed away from the surface. And these are um, some biological images that are taken from the tissue that the electrodes were implanted in. So this is an electrode is basically going into the page. This is kind of the track in the tissue that the electrode made. And you can basically now use uh, certain molecules to make color the cells uh, so you can tell whether a cell is astrocyte or a neuron. And what you see here is that scurrying around the electrode. Okay, so how are you doing so far? Is this, does it make sense so far? Cool. Yeah. So, yeah. Now, these electrodes will not damage the, uh, the neurons. So there, you have a few, uh, definitely some neurons get damaged, but the brain uh, can basically reroute them. So the, it's a, in a volume, you have the surfaces of the, uh, the, the ones that make contact with the surface get damaged, but yeah. outside it typically uh, stays healthy. Yeah, so it's, uh, of course, you are piercing into the brain tissue, but then uh, it's, that's actually not, is not as uh, damaging as it could be. It's more, the body's response to it is what actually becomes more uh, damaging, uh, exactly. Yeah, so, um, the important considerations are you want a small electrode footprint. So you basically kind of like a similar to a digital camera. You, if you have smaller electrodes that are more densely packed, you have higher spatial resolution. But uh, you also want electrical impedance. So just from instrumentation theory, if the electrical impedance of this electrode is low, it's connected to an instrumentation amplifier and you can actually pick up these uh, uh, voltage changes, if you will, uh, with much higher SNR. Uh, if, you, uh, if the impedance is very high, then you are picking up the thermal noise from the instrumentation and you are not really getting your signal. 
Another one uh, is you basically want to minimize this adverse tissue response and have the neurons attached to the surfaces by, uh, as much as possible. So we address this first one by um, uh, using this porous electrode. So what you see here is you have a glass cover slip. Uh, this is about three inches by three inches. And you cover this with a material called photoresist. So this is a photosensitive polymer. And when you expose it and develop it, the parts that are exposed to light basically come out. So now we have this opening that corresponds to these traces, metal traces that you see. And then you use another technique to deposit chrome, gold, and gold silver, which is basically that alloy that I mentioned, which is the precursor to nanoporous gold. And then you basically want to have an insulator so only the electrode tips are uh, exposed. And finally, you put this in nitric acid, and you can basically turn this into nanoporous gold. So this is actually, if you are not familiar with this, this is the very standard uh, technology or the core of microfabrication for building chips. So you, the, you do this with different layers over and over again, and you can have millions of transistors basically patterned all at once. Uh, but uh, this is basically just one step of it that we uh, use. So you have these electrodes, uh, and you have the tips, and they, they are porous. So we measure the impedance, and the impedance in the biological system is more uh, electrochemical impedance. So it's, you have an electrode immersed in a solution, and we are basically measuring the impedance at that interface. And you can see that compared to a flat gold electrode with the nanoporous gold, we basically reduce the electrical impedance. Do, do you have any uh, thoughts on why the impedance would go down uh, for a porous structure? It's the same size, but it's porous compared to planar gold. More surface area? More surface area. And it's actually, this is Randall cell. So you have a resistor and a, and a resistor and a capacitor in parallel. So you are actually increasing the capacitor, uh, capacitance by increasing the surface area. And at higher frequencies, basically, it reduces the uh, electrical impedance. So this is good from an electrical point of view. But you need to verify this uh, biologically. So if you were to now comp uh, couple this with neurons, does this actually pick up things with higher signal to noise ratio? So in order to do this, we basically use uh, a model uh, called organotypic uh, brain slice model. So from uh, basically uh, hippocampus, this is a, a rat brain diagram, uh, you can dissect the hippocampus, and then you can basically make slices that are, uh, that are 300 microns thick. The advantage of this method is uh, you actually still preserve the architecture of the cells. So you are not really dissociating the cells. So you can think about it in electrical, electrical engineering terms. You have a slice that has the circuitry still. If you have like a 3D circuitry, you make a slice, and in that plane, you would still have some circuitry remaining. And that's important for uh, studying, for example, epilepsy, which is very analogous to an electrical circuit becoming unstable. You have the neural circuits, and if they all get excited at once due to positive feedback, then they all begin to fire at once, and that's basically what an epileptic seizure is. So it's a good model for studying those. Anyways, you get the organotypic brain slice, and then you uh, place it on that electrode array that we built. So this is basically an organotypic brain slice you see here. And these electrodes are 200 microns uh, apart, uh, 30 microns uh, in diameter, and they are made of the porous gold. What you see here is if you record, uh, look at the uh, electrophysiology, so the electrical signals the neurons are putting out, this is for a planar gold surface, this is for a porous gold surface. You first thing you notice uh, is basically you reduce the uh, noise floor uh, when you go to the porous gold. And this is really due to the lowered impedance. You basically now match with those voltage changes a little bit better in the electrode. But then you also begin to reveal uh, more signal, if you will. So we reduce the noise, but there is actually a higher signal. So any thoughts on why there could be higher signal? What, could, uh, what, is, the, what is actually generating the signal? Neurons, right? Neurons are pumping these ions, and they are the signal generators. So that these neurons should be closer to the electrode, as I described before, the basic transmitter-receiver problem. That hence, we are seeing a higher signal here. So we got interested in looking into, so what could be promoting the neurons to be closer to the surface? And uh, just before I move on there, another thing to notice here is that you can make the circuit unstable, and you can actually kind of simulate an uh, uh, epilepsy-like uh, the, the outcome in the slice model over here. So the things we do uh, with this are, um, there are a couple of things. 
approaches we take for uh, basically looking at how, um, uh, how to modify, how to make, make the neurons closer to this electrode. Must be like larger images that it takes a while. Um, to, yeah. Let's see. Okay. So we, have, we look at three different modes for doing it. One is through topographical cues, and the other one is through releasing drugs molecules from the porous surface. So this is a scanning electron microscope image uh, of one of those cells that I mentioned, astrocytes, the scar forming cells, basically holding onto that porous gold electrode. So the scale is, uh, pores are about hundreds of nanometers here. So they are, we are still in the like hundredth of the thickness of a hair regime. And what you see is the cell is basically sending out these structures that are holding onto the surface. So we started with a very simple uh, hypothesis. Basically, we thought that maybe uh, different cell types, like neurons and the astrocytes, attach to the surfaces with different strength. And this is somewhat similar to if you are um, into camping, you basically set up a tent, you put the stakes on the ground, and if you have a flat surface, basically you put them and the tent is in tension and it's stable on the ground. The wind doesn't just blow it away. But let's say now you have a corrugated ground with a lot of pits, and if your configuration of the stakes do not allow you to put the stakes in, then it's less stable. So the wind can just basically uh, blow it away. And basically we are interested in seeing whether cells have these different stake structure. And that stake structure is actually the proteins. So you have proteins that basically anchor the cell onto a surface. And we are basically trying to see whether there's a difference between the two. To do this, it's a simple experiment. Uh, you basically have a planar surface and a nanoporous uh, surface. You take cells, again, from the uh, rat brain, uh, dissociate them. Now we have a mixed population. You have both astrocytes and neurons, but the circuitry is lost. And you basically culture them on there. You plate them, keep them in basically 37 Celsius in a liquid for a while, so they grow. And uh, two weeks later, you basically take them out and you can again color them to see which cell is which. So you basically have the green cells that are the, uh, the uh, astrocytes, red ones are the neurons. And now you can do image analysis, like digital image processing, uh, like we use MATLAB, to basically count uh, how many cells we have and how spread they are, what's their geometry and everything like that, all of which tell you something about how the cells are reacting to that surface. So what we've seen is these are a little bit hard to see, but the neurons were not actually affected by the surfaces, whether it's on gold or nanoporous gold, which is nice, uh, because we want the neurons to be close to the surface. But those scar-forming cells actually got reduced, or they were less spread on the porous gold, which is also nice, because we now kind of this suggests that the neurons can stick better and astrocytes the cells that we don't want to enter between the neuron and the electrode are kind of deterred. So we've done, uh, so the reasons could this, for this could be the metallurgical reasons and topographical reasons. So just let me def uh, define these quickly. One of them could be like, a, like our hypothesis, the topography may be influencing how a cell attaches, but there could be also, since these are made from silver gold, there may be some residual silver in it. Maybe that is toxic to the cells as well. Um, so in order to decouple that, we used a method called atomic layer deposition. So this is basically a vapor-based vapor method that can create a very thin insulating shell uh, on a surface. So when you do that, you basically create that shell on the porous gold, which now cannot, uh, if there are any trapped silver ions, they cannot come out of the surface. And when you do this, you basically see, so this is a little bit crowded here, but these are the neuron coverage, percent coverage on a surface. You see that whether it's glass, gold, nanoporous gold, or that insulator shell on it, there is no difference between them. But if you go to the astrocytes, the cells that we didn't want, with nanoporous gold, whether it's coated with that uh, thin insulating sheet, uh, aluminum oxide or not, you still have that reduced spreading, which is actually good news because now it suggests that it's not a toxicity effect, but it's actually the uh, topography that guides how a cell attaches onto the surface. So we've done quite a few studies on these two, basically study, I won't go into much depth about those, how these focal adhesions, uh, the, basically the protein counterparts of those stakes of the cells influence uh, the cell attachment. And one thing you could also do with this is now uh, you can have surfaces that basically deter the cells. So if you have a chip with basically uh, patterned uh, porous uh, parts to them, you can actually, if you put uh, cells on them, they can self-assemble only on those structures. So let's say 
you have cells that you want to create a, a circuit out of them. You can actually uh, draw the, the lines with the porous electrodes and the neurons would actually just uh, go on those. So you can create these neural circuits with them. So the next thing I'm going to mention um, uh, is uh, the drug delivery aspect. So what this is, uh, uh, we have a porous sponge. So you can actually load drug molecules in them. Uh, and this is uh, useful for, so there are actually ad applications of these. For example, vascular stents. Uh, if uh, it's put into the uh, body and then it uh, opens up. So if a, blo uh, a vein is clogged, it basically opens it up. Again, a similar problem happens there. The body reacts to it and begins to form a scar. And eventually, that scar actually occludes the vein. So there is basically research being done on, can you load drug molecules in that, uh, on the surface of the stent so they release the drug molecules and basically suppress that scar forming. So we are uh, basically using a similar methodology here, where you have, again, a glass and a gold or a nanopore gold surface on it. We load them with uh, fluorescent molecules because now uh, they are of the same size and chemical properties uh, with the drug molecules that you would use. Fluorescent because you can now keep track of them very easily by just looking at their fluorescence, how much is actually coming out. So you uh, incubate them in a fluorescent solution, wash them, and then basically put them in water and look at over time how they come out. And what you see here is uh, you have different thicknesses of these porous films, and over time, basically, uh, the fluorescein is released and it eventually depletes, and you uh, determine the loading capacity, how much fluorescein was loading into these surfaces. So something that happens interesting, when you go to small scale, basically physics begins to change in some ways. I mean, so for electrical engineering, probably uh, like tunneling, for example, if you've taken device physics, it does not exist in macro scale, but it actually exists uh, in nanoscale. So what happens with uh, really small pores is, Typically, if you have a sponge and if you put it, uh, put let's say uh, uh, fluorescent molecules in them, these are really short distances for a molecule to travel. So it would take milliseconds for that molecule to come out. But here we are seeing that it's actually taking uh, on the order of uh, almost a day to come out. And what happens is, um, so you can think of this pore structure as a continuous channel. But now these are so small that the drug molecules are actually a similar size as the channel. So now if you imagine if you are running uh, through a very uh, narrow tunnel and it's dark, so you are bouncing off the walls, you basically, how much you interact with the wall determines how fast you would leave the tunnel. So it's the same idea here. Basically, what determines how fast a drug molecule leaves this porous sponge is how many times and how long it interacts with the surfaces as it's coming out. So this gives us a lot of opportunities to actually tune uh, how fast you can uh, get the drug molecules out. And I'll give uh, uh, one example of this. One, uh, uh, you can actually change the electrical, uh, so you can change the surface properties by um, adding uh, chemical moieties. But you can also change the surface charge. So uh, remember, nanopore gold sponge, basically, it's electrically conductive. So if you have a drug molecule and uh, that is negatively charged, that is in that porous structure, if you apply a positive potential, the drug molecules would electrostatically attach to the wall and it would stay there. But if you apply a negative potential, you can actually push those drug molecules out. So now you can create arbitrary waveforms of the drug molecules. You can do dosing in, on the order of picoliters of drug molecules that you can release. So putting it all together, what we are working on now is um, creating kind of a closed loop system in a dish where you can record the electrical activity from these brain, brain slices and we can invoke epileptic seizures. So you invoke an epileptic seizure, you pick it up with instrumentation amplifiers and then we have a closed loop that stimulates those electrodes so you can release drug molecules and stop that seizure from occurring. So we are basically, this is kind of what we are working on uh, with this uh, project. So I'll switch gears on to the second thing I'm going to talk about, but uh, so far, do you have any uh, questions on this? Yeah, I'm kind of curious. Uh, when you do the, you form the nanopores, mm -hmm. what kind of residual contaminants might you have that end up on the surface of, of that? You mean silver, right? Yeah. So you actually don't end up with any on the surface, but some gets uh, some are trapped. It trapped. And so nitric acid, removes silver, but it does not do anything to gold, but just 
increase the surface diffusivity. So you end up with about 3 to 5% silver remaining. You originally start with about 75% silver, and okay. uh, most of it is actually gone, which is kind of interesting on its own. If you have a, there's something called parting limit. So if you are below 60% silver, if you put it in nitric acid, it does not form the pore structure, and you end up with 60% silver. So that's basically the art form depletion gilding that the, that's used in jewelry. In order to purify a metal, you actually put more impurities in it, and then you can all of us uh, all together get all of it out. Uh, does yeah. that trap silver present any problems with the applications that you're addressing? Not, not for this one. Uh, for this yeah, one. so it's um, if if it comes to the surface, you may have some toxicity effects, mm -hmm. but they are pretty uh, trapped in the ligaments and they don't come out. Uh, so not not okay. as far as we can yeah. tell. Yeah. yeah. Well. Uh, did you do any experiment right now on the, on the patient now with this, at this time or not? Not with this one, no. We are slowly moving into uh, small animal studies, but mostly we've been doing it in, in vitro at the moment. Now, yeah. when you go, let's say, to mouse or whatever for, mm -hmm. uh, for sta animal studies, then um, um, as far as, you know, the, the, uh, the brain there is so small. I mean, mm -hmm. you are talking about like what, maybe like a pea or whatever. Maybe smaller. Mm -hmm. Now, would this thing work there? Yeah. So, rat brain is actually about like this big. So, it's actually not super small, uh, like a, about this much, right. uh, like this half of a coin or something like that. Yeah. So, with those, you could actually, uh, the electrodes are very small, so it's hair thin, right? right. Uh, so, it takes practice to do the surgery for it, but uh, it, it is actually not that, uh, that hard with yeah. rat. I mean, with mouse, it's smaller. It's a little bit harder, but uh, it it still works in those uh, in those animals as well. Yeah. And then it, it gives you, I mean, uh, reliable answers. Or whatever. Yeah. So you with biology, you do many repeats. But that's basically when the statics statistics become very important. You typically do like ten uh, per each case, so you have some statistical power. Right. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Any other questions? All right. So the next thing I'm going to mention is the. Pathogen detection. So this is kind of important and easy to describe. For humans, plants, and foods, we basically want to detect pathogens pretty quickly, right? So you, for food safety, safety, if there's a contamination, you want to know early on so you don't get a lot of people sick. With humans, you basically want to be able to detect, uh, like, diagnose diseases uh, a lot earlier as well. So one thing that's very useful for this is nucleic acids. So DNA and RNA, basically, that exists in the living tissue. These are very specific to the organism. So if you can detect that, then you can tell what kind of an organism that is as well. And there are different techniques for doing it, but electrochemical means is nice because uh, since it's electrical, you can easily tie it to the peripheral electronics. So if you wanted to have a handheld uh, pathogen detector, it's a lot easier to do it with uh, electronics than uh, sophisticated optics that require uh, like, uh, basically more uh, form factor. So in a nutshell, we, I described how we made electrodes. You kind of use a very similar electrode system here. So over time, basically, as we went towards nanotechnology, you began to use nanostructured things like the carbon nanotubes or uh, other pillars. Uh, and uh, you've probably also seen in uh, news or uh, read about it as well. There is definitely a lot of excitement about nanotechnology, but now we are reaching a point that people um, the science is almost lagging behind. The hype is a little bit f further than it. So you, what we've tried to do is understand why uh, nanostructure or nanotechnology actually enhances some of these sensor properties. And uh, I'll give you a very basic uh, introduction of how a pathogen sensor works uh, with electrochemistry. So you have, um, so what, first off, uh, let's say you have a blood sample that you are testing. You take the blood. You put it in a centrifuge, so all the larger molecules settle down, and then you have some DNA there, uh, let's say uh, DNA that circulates in the body that may have come, came off from a cancer cell. So you have very few of them, right? So you are trying to detect those. You need, uh, basically, DNA comes in strands, so you need a strand that is complementary to it. So when they match, like a lock and key, you know you've caught the right one. So that one, uh, the, the capture probe is attached to the uh, electrode like this. You basically use uh, sulfur, which has high affinity to gold. And then you have the DNA, which is about 26 bases. And then you introduce something called redox molecules, methylene blue. And methylene blue goes and physically attaches to that probe. So with the redox molecules, if you 
bring it to a certain potential, electro, uh, electrochemical potential, you can actually take an electrode out, electron out or put an electron in. In this case, we put an electron in, so we reduce the methane in blue, and when you put an electron in, you actually get a current. So basically, you get um, a current signal due to reducing these methylene blue on the surface that is uh, attached to the DNA probes. So this tells us basically how much DNA we have, and that becomes your base signal, the probe. Now, if you introduce that uh, DNA that you got from the blood, and if that matches with the sequence you have here, then they hybridize, so they basically uh, match together. And when that happens, now there is less room for the methylene blue, so it gets kicked out, and what would happen if you now run the electrochemistry, apply the same voltage? <coughs> Basically, the signal goes down, right? Because now you have less of those molecules that gave us the signal. So now you have a drop in the signal. And this signal suppression we call, which is a drop in the signal, is quantitative for whether you caught the right uh, target and how much of it you caught. So this basically gives us a simple electrochemical signal as far as whether you captured something. And what we are interested in here is, so like for most sensors, uh, the parameters are very similar. So if you have a sensors and you look at the specs, it tells you limit of detection, dynamic range. So it's the same idea here. Basically, you want lower limit of detection and basically the dynamic range tuned to the concentration of the molecules you are trying to detect. So what we've done is basically, since we can modify the morphology very easily, we've basically uh, looked at um, how um, changing the morphology changes the dynamic range. And the dynamic range is, so this is the concentration of those DNA molecules that we are trying to detect in a solution. And if you use a planar surface with no structuring, you can only detect in this uh, one uh, like micromolar range. But when you go to the porous structures, you can actually begin to drop. And the reason for this is actually uh, kind of, again, uh, these are all called transport problems. So you basically have a molecule that's transported to a, a location, and then it basically goes under reaction. So it's very uh, basic chemical engineering process. It's kind of like you have a fire. The oxygen basically needs to attach, uh, come to that surface, and then react and burn. So if the, if it's burning too fast, you don't have enough oxygen. If it's uh, basically not burning fast, then it's basically... What's your annealing process? It's actually, um, uh, typically we do like 250 to 300 Celsius. Uh, and we do it in air, but you could do it in nitrogen as well. Okay. And I'll mention a couple of other techniques that we use. But what happens here is basically if you have a planar surface, and let's, uh, if that DNA that we want to capture is just wandering around uh, through thermal motion, if it comes to the surface and it does, if we don't catch it, it can go back into the solution and we don't get a signal. But if you have a pore structure and if it goes into the pore, then it's surrounded with so much of those capture probes, you actually have increased probability of capturing it. And this is called a kinetic equilibrium. So you basically, due to that increased probability, you increase, uh, you enhance your limit of detection. And with that, you can tune the, uh, basically the dynamic range. So another problem uh, is uh, when you want to detect something from blood, blood has a lot of stuff in it, right? It has cells, other proteins. When you put an electrode in that, all those proteins uh, attach to the surface. Basically, they just stick to that surface. And these are uh, due to Van der Waals interactions. Maybe you remember it uh, from physics. It's basically the same idea how a gecko walks basically on a glass, that interaction. So when you have a lot of those proteins attached to the electrode, same problem with the neural interface happens. You now have an electrically insulating uh, layer there, and now we cannot uh, put in any electrons there to reduce those methylene blue. And the example of it here is, if you have a planar surface, and this is your target concentration, if you are doing it in uh, a solution that does not have any proteins, it's very pure, it works pretty well. You have very large signal suppression. But if you add uh, proteins to it, which is basically serum that you can take from the blood, now the surface is fouled and your signal to noise ratio is very low. So if you do this with nanopore scald, it's actually not affected by the proteins. And so how is this even possible? What we thought, hypothesized is that the porous electrode actually acts like an intrinsic sieve. So those large proteins or cells get stuck on the top surface, but they don't block it because pores are not perfectly uh, circular. So those small redox molecules and the fibrillary hair-like DNA can actually seep through the uh, pores, which are not uh, inhibited by the proteins. And you can basically get a signal in serum or no serum, a comparable one. To test this, whether this is the case, 
what we could do is we can enlarge the pores through that annealing process. Mm -hmm. And uh, just as we see here, you actually now proteins can go deeper into the pores and uh, inhibit deeper pores, and it does not work uh, as well anymore. So it basically begins to approach that planar gold case. So this is actually very important because if you're trying to detect something on the field, like let's say you're uh, on the field and trying to detect some pathogens, you would normally you would need to do all this purification step stuff to uh, steps to get the uh, the pure DNA out before you can uh, apply it to the sensor. But with this one, we can actually circumvent that. You can take the blood, just basically chop out the DNA, and you can detect directly from it. So that should like cut down the uh, detection time significantly. One one last thing we do with this is um, uh, you can actually once we uh, have these probes attached uh, uh, DNA. Uh, and detect the target molecule in um, the protein solution, we can now wash those protein solutions. So this is kind of a schematic of a pore cross-section. And now we can apply an electrochemical potential to break the sulfur gold bond. So now we have the DNA molecules that we've captured are in that porous sponge. And if we apply a negative potential, DNA has these phosphate groups which are negatively charged. You can actually push the DNA uh, hybrids out of the solution. And this is useful because now we, if we, we have a very complex environment, we can capture, uh, basically pull down those rare DNA or RNA from the solution and now purify it. So you can do downstream analysis for, for example, looking at mutations. If, let's say you uh, caught cancer uh, determinant nucleic acids, you can actually do the uh, uh, downstream analysis of it. Um, and um, I won't go into the details of this. One. Uh, uh, Another thing that I want to just uh, finish up uh, by mentioning is, so as you can see that most of the studies we do have a large um, dependence on the morphology of the electrodes. So it becomes pretty, uh, it becomes kind of a hassle um, if you are trying to um, test different morphologies influence on uh, basically how it affects the sensor performance or how it affects the biological uh, 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 performance. So what we are trying to do is actually create these, um, if I can go up one, no, I think it's that uh, next slide is the problematic one. Uh, anyways, we basically use the microfabrication technology to put multiple uh, morphologies on a single chip. So now you can basically in high throughput, instead of testing one morphology at a time, in a chip you can test like tens of morphologies at once, so you cut down the time to determining it. And for this one, we use an electrical uh, method, so you have uh, uh, electrodes, basically patterned on glass, but we can change the geometry in the middle, so you basically increase uh, putting constraints here, which increases your current density, so uh, you have basically narrow regions, and it heats more. Uh, due to joule heating, due to the higher current density. And it anneals differentially in different regions. So in one application of voltage and current uh, flowing through these branches, you can end up with different morphologies on a single chip. Another advantage here is um, the electrical resistance, as you may imagine, this is basically uh, the current flowing through that porous path. It's basically a lot of tiny wires just uh, in 3D carrying the current. So if you change the architecture of those by annealing it and coarsening them, you're actually changing the resistivity of that uh, 3D electrode. And that correlates very well with morphology. So you can actually keep track of the resistance change due to the morphology change or structure change of the electrode. So this is basically the thickness of these individual ligaments. This is the uh, resistance change. So now you can kind of dial in the morphology you want and you keep track of the resistance and you can basically get that morphology uh, that you're interested in. And we do different uh, methods for doing it. Another one is basically through laser annealing. Uh, this one, uh, I won't actually mention this one. This is more of an etching process. So taking together, this is kind of, the, in a nutshell, what my group does. Uh, so most of my uh, students graduated now and it's, it's a very interdisciplinary research and UC Davis, we have a graduate program structure so you can advise students in different uh, departments. So the, people, uh, the person who did the majority of the uh, pathogen detection was an electrical engineering student. She's at uh, Illumina at the moment. Who, uh, the person who did the drug delivery uh, is, uh, was a chemical engineering student and uh, he's at Intel, she's at Intel at the moment. And, uh, then uh, we, uh, the, the other, uh, the, this student, uh, Chris Chapman, was a biomedical engineering student, and he basically did the neural, uh, more of the neural work. 
and he uh, basically went into uh, uh, as a postdoc to uh, UK. And uh, finally, Tatiana is the one that did that uh, annealing study who was an uh, electrical engineer. So now um, the group basically has uh, kind of a uh, demographic like that. Um, so with that, uh, thanks for your time. And I can take any questions you may have. So how, how many graduate students do you, that are, you currently have that are active? And are you adding more or growing the group? Or? So it's really dictated by grants. Yeah. Uh, so we had, uh, we had a time where the grants aligned. So you have to spend it as sure. well. So at that point, we had, I think, about seven PhD students, two postdocs, and a master's student. Okay. Now, four of them graduated, and two of the postdocs basically went to different positions. So we are now three PhD students, two master's students. How, how do you find the interest among the funding agencies? So we, um, we are, at the moment, funded by uh, NSF, uh, two NSF grants. Before that, we had more uh, UC system-wide initiatives. And this is very applicable to National Institutes of Health, uh, NIH. So yeah. we have some uh, grants in works uh, there as well. Um, but um, it's, so I mean, it's actually, I just submitted my last grant yesterday, so I'm very like happy and relaxed. But we, uh, basically you submit to a lot of different agencies uh, on different aspects of it. So we go to NIH with the health aspect. But for example, that annealing, uh, the electrical annealing, for that one, I go to NSF's materials division. Um, so for the pathogen sensing, we go to both NIH and also NSF's fundamentals of sensing. Okay. Like so, uh, we kind of branch out to the. Have you had to deal with the FDA? No, we. I didn't have to do that yet. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But that will come, right? Yeah. So what we? I mean, we have a uh, we have a spin-off company that we kind of license some of this to, uh, like the pathogen detection, that they are looking into it. I. Um, I personally like the fundamental science aspect more than the product development. Yeah. So I think once it gets to that point, we patent it and maybe license it. So the engineers actually, I mean, I, I guess I'm an engineer. But I'm bringing it up because I've had some experience with the FDA. I was part of a project once, and we had a project manager in Massachusetts that dealt with them directly, mm -hmm. and he got on the wrong side, and the project was canceled. Wow. So it's tricky. Yeah. No, it also depends on the application. For example, for pathogen detection, the blood is out. So it's yeah. you have less constraints. For neural interfaces, right. it's implanted. So it's a lot harder. Right. Right. Yeah. And at that point, you basically typically license it to uh, like Medtronic or some medical company with a lot of money to, that can carry that stuff around. Yeah. yeah. How did you, so uh, when you attach the like half DNA strands or whatever, um, mm -hmm. where do you get like DNA strands that are going to match up mm -hmm. with it from? Uh, how do you uh, so you, there are companies you can order them. So you, uh, you literally write the sequence down and you tell them I need this much and they basically ship it to you as a powder and then you just add liquid, liquid to it to basically uh, have it and you have a stock that then you can use basically. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah there are... Uh, that's very useful, basically. You can just uh, do it yourself. Yeah. And for the, uh, the first part of the talk, when you talk about the uh, electrodes and so forth, uh, do you need to go to FDA or uh, some other uh, organization, the government, to get the approval to use them on human beings? You would need to, I mean, that is, clinical studies is a completely different thing. So you would need, uh, I mean, you need an IRB protocol, you need to, you don't necessarily need an FDA for the clinical study, uh, but when you're actually testing it at the product product stage, you would need to do that. Um, so for us, I mean, for the blood one, actually, pathogen detection, we would need to do an IRB. Like if we are testing, even if you are testing blood samples uh, from patients that they gave away, uh, like that, were, that they were in excess, you'd need some sort of a approval from your institution, from UC Davis. Uh, institutional Review Board, it is called. For animal work, there's a similar one. You need to write a protocol and then they approve it and then you can only do the um, uh, research on them. And basically grants agencies, uh, funding agencies need those approvals before they can give you the money as well. So it's actually pretty tightly regulated, even in academia. Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, basically, they, in the old days, uh, you wanted to you know in the master's program and so on, we were in fact very much, I mean, a little bit focused, I shouldn't say very much, but a little bit focused on the bio, uh, mm -hmm. uh, medical aspects and so forth, and biological aspects, but then, uh, you know, uh, basically, we, 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 did, we, we could not, you know, con con continue doing that. Mm -hmm. and so on. But this is really a very interesting thing, and so on. And, yeah. I'm glad. Yeah, yeah biology is, uh, it's easy to, um, uh, relevance is high. That's the thing. So I mean, I did my PhD was more mechanics of things, right? So it's it's you can still get excited about it, but it's hard to make another person excited about. It. I feel like with medical work, it's usually you know somebody who has a disease, so you it's easier to kind of uh, get motivated about it. I think, yeah. And especially when you are talking about epilepsy and uh, all of those, if you succeed in uh, you know. In this area is really going to be very helpful today yeah. you know, to all of these patients that we have. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you.